Right, so we can see your screen, we can see you, and we can hear you, so we're all set um, for our next lecture. Today, um, we have Valerio Matrone telling us a little bit about the impact QCD can have on electro read processes and how we can utilize it in basically in both directions, I suppose, and to learn about QCD also from, from electro read processes. So yes, Valerio, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, for the invitation. It's, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. So as Frank said, um, today I'll be talking about, uh, well, mostly gradient production, as you see in, in the title. And uh, well, the point of view is actually the, the, the viewpoint of QCD. And today I will be give a theoretical introduction, uh, while tomorrow we'll be concentrating more on the phenomenological aspects of gradient and actually also some Higgs production, because as I will try to argue tomorrow, uh, this connected with with uh, trillion production. So let me let me go to the uh, outline of the of the talk. So first, I will start with uh, an historical introduction. So I will very briefly introduce the parton model. It's just one slide. I, I guess that we'll get a better introduction to it by Ingo tomorrow, and I will. Uh, show you how Trillian was first computed the, using the, the Parton model and how uh, it was uh, confronted to data. Then I will introduce the QCD. Well, I, I would not really introduce the QCD, but I will try to show you how QCD uh, influences how it, it impacts the, the, the computation of Trillian. And so I will uh, argue that we need a factorization theorem and I will try to sketch the proof of the factorization theorem. The factorization theorem eventually enables us to, to compute higher order corrections. I will show that higher order corrections sometimes uh, fail and uh, this opens the floor to, to resumation. And the resumation is essentially a technology that allows us to uh, resume uh, large logarithms that, that uh, happen in, in specific uh, corners of, uh, of the phase space. We, we will discuss the origin of these logarithms. Uh, I will discuss a little bit how to resume these logarithms. And this will eventually lead us to the so-called CSS formalism after Collins, Sofer, and Stirp. And I will connect this formalism to TMD factorization. And then if time allows, I will also discuss a little bit uh, what are the, the non-perturbative effects that happen when one considers uh, the, the TMD factorization. So let me start with the Parton model in a, in a, in a nutshell. Uh, so something that I find amusing is that, well, in my opinion, the Parton model was really born as a, as a leap of faith. And so here I'm, I'm quoting an excerpt from, uh, from Richard Feynman's um, original paper in which the, the Parton model was actually introduced. And he says explicitly, I'm more sure than uh, the conclusions that any of the single argument which suggested them to me. So this means that even uh, Richard Feynman uh, couldn't give uh, a solid argument uh, to his intuition. So he felt that the Parton model was correct, but he didn't really feel uh, sure about the arguments he, he, he was giving to it. So this is a very short paper, then I would suggest everybody to, to have a look at that. Um, then just in a nutshell, the core of the Parton model is the following. So in the Parton model, hadrons are considered to be made of partons. So back then they didn't even know that partons were quarks and, and gluons. So QCT wasn't mature enough to to, to say that. Um, and partons are free elementary particles that undergo instantaneous interactions with the projectile that carries a large energy. So this means that partons interact with, with very high energy projectiles instantaneously. Uh, and this actually allows us to uh, consider uh, partons as uh, free particles. So we can consider hadrons as made up of uh, free particles that don't interact uh, uh, between themselves. And the reason is that the binding energies are of the order of the hadron uh, mass, which is assumed to be much smaller than, uh, than the energy carried by the, the projectile. And so this means that we can uh, describe uh, hadron interactions, hadron collisions in terms of free particles, the, the partons. So the idea of uh, the parton model was by the, the, the year after by Drell and Young in, in this uh, very nice paper. Uh, and so actually uh, they applied the, the, the Parton model in uh, the, the inclusive production of a massive lepton pair 
in hadron and hadron collision. This is what we call Dre Young today. So, and this actually is after this paper. And here you see a sketch of the process. So you have two protons, uh, two incoming protons. Then you extract something apart from, from your protons. Uh, which, which now we actually know to be quarks, quark and anti-quark. They annihilate into a virtual photon. That could also be a Z, but back then they didn't even know that Z was there. And then the Z eventually decays into uh, a lepton pair. So I will indicate with Q the invariant mass of the lepton pair and square root of S because of the collision center of mass energy. So Drell um, and calculated the uh, cross-section differential in Q square uh, for this process and uh, they found uh, this very simple formula so first of all something i would like to stress is that they computed the the, the prefactor but they didn't have a color factor that has to be in the denominator here and the reason is that was that qcd back then wasn't known so they, they couldn't really have this factor there so th this was already something that would make uh, the part model uh, easy to compare to data. And then uh, the, there is a, a factor that depends on the part on distribution functions. We have already seen what they are. Uh, but actually, in the context of the, the parton model, parton distribution functions don't have an operator definition. They can really be interpreted like uh, probability distribution functions. So they are really the probability density of finding uh, uh, a parton of flavor Q, a quark, with uh, a longitudinal momentum fraction Y in the, in the probe. So they are really probability distributions. So the same, uh, the same year uh, at BNL, uh, Dralian in uh, proton uranium collision was, was measured in uh, mu plus U minus was, was the final state. And so I'm quoting from that paper, and uh, they say the parton model is in rough shape agreement uh, with the data. So uh, already back then, uh, the, the, the parton model started to, 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 to reap some, some, some uh, success. And actually, uh, on the left hand side, you see the prediction of the parton model, and on the right hand side, you see the, the, the data. So, what the parton model was able to do was to predict the, the fall off of the, the cross section with Q square. Uh, but actually, we already knew that the the, the normalization was wrong. For instance, uh, the, the factor one over NC was, was missing and also the parton distribution functions weren't uh, very well known. Actually, it was computed in terms of DIS structure functions, with, which in the parton model are actually the same thing as PDF. And then something that probably you have noticed is that in the data there is a bump. So uh, this actually uh, reminds me that throughout the, the, the talk, there will be some questions to you, and that, that this is, these are questions that can be discussed over over discussion tonight. Um, that yeah, I would just like to to, to think about. So in this particular case, is uh, can you guess what is the origin of this bump that appears around the three GT in the, the invariant mass spectrum of trillion? So we can discuss it tonight. Now, as I, as I said in the beginning, at some point, QCD became mature, it was introduced. So I'm not going to reintroduce you QCD, you have already had some very nice lectures in the, in the past days. All I want to stress here is that the partner model that already started to being used and seemed to, 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 to be working is fundamentally different from, from QCD. The partner model is a semi-classical model, so it's really based on classical ideas, on free particles that interact uh, um, instantaneously. On the, other, on the other end, we have uh, we have the QCD. The QCD is a, is a full-fledged quantum field theory that, you know, how it works, it assumes some, some matter content quarks and then you, you you enforce the gauge symmetry which is an su 3 and an abelian symmetry and then you generate the the interaction so there are two completely different views of of nature yet the the surprising thing is that when one discusses trillion the part and model can actually be regarded like uh, the skeleton of qcd it's like a qcd uh, is an improvement of the the part and model so this is quite surprising if you think about that and the reason for that to happen is that actually QCD obeys two basic properties. The first is that QCD is renormalizable. So actually we can discuss tonight why this is important. And on top of that, when one uh, looks uh, at uh, the cross section for Trillian, QCD also enjoys leading power factorization. So this means that we can, we can uh, in computing a, a cross section, we can split uh, term, which I have indicated here with uh, sigma hat that contains the high energy uh, contribution to the cross section, and a term that instead contains the low energy contribution to the cross section. And actually this term here 
implies as a byproduct definition and operator definition of, of the, the PDFs, which is, of course, also very important to understand PDFs. Moreover, as I said before, QCD is a non-abelian theory, and so this non-abeliality entails also the fact that the coupling is asymptotically free, so it becomes smaller and smaller as the, the energy of the, the process increases. And so this means that uh, we are enabled to uh, use perturbation theory to compute uh, the high energy uh, part of the cross-section. And so in other words, we can regard the QCD as uh, an improvement on, on, on the part of the model. And actually also factorization enables us to use uh, QCD to systematically improve on the part of the model by computing more and more perturbative corrections. So now let me, I, I just want to sketch uh, a proof of factorization for, for Drillian. This is actually a very complicated thing that I would I would like to try to sketch in uh, in a few steps. So uh, here is, is a sketch of the brilliant. Um, so you have two incoming protons, and then you have uh, a pair of leptons that uh, uh, in the final state. So here in the gray blob, you have uh, anything that you can imagine. So you have all possible interactions, all possible loops. So this means that the, this guy here generates a multidimensional space uh, uh, in momentum space generated by the loops. But you also have the real radiations. Uh, so you can have hard real radiation. So usually you have jets, so you have uh, hadrons in the final state, but you also have soft and collinear radiation. So radiation with uh, low energy and also radiation that ends up in the beam pipe. Uh, and so that's uh, the general picture. It's a very complicated picture. But then actually what you can do, you can uh, take QCD and apply the so-called Libby's term on power counting uh, uh, to the scattering up to, 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 to identify what I, I, I what one could define the large Q asymptote. So this means that uh, suppose you, you send the, the, the invariant mass, in this case of the, the lepton pair, to, to infinity. So th this has to be very, very large. This means that you can really uh, decompose uh, your amplitude uh, in, uh, uh, in different modes. And so this, this, uh, this diagram actually shows what is the effect of this, this power counting. Uh, in, a, in, in a quarian gauge. And so you have uh, uh, four different modes that actually contribute the most to, to, to the, the amplitude. There are collinear and anticollinear modes, so where moment are uh, either collinear or anticollinear to, to the, to the uh, collision axis. And then uh, you have soft modes in which uh, the, the, moment to, the moment are all small. And then you have also hard modes in which you, the moment are, are really large. Then what the power counting tells you is that uh, First of all, the collinear blobs uh, are connected to the hard blob only through a collinear quark. It can, can also be a, can also be a, a gluon, actually, but uh, um, at leading that that's that's a quark. Uh, and then, in, in addition, on top of this collinear quark, you can have any number of gluons with a specific uh, polarization that is called the scalar polarization. That's actually an physical polarization that anyway you, you need to take into account. But uh, so th those gluons can be there. Then on top of that, you don't have any connections between uh, the hard blob and the soft blob. And finally, you have any number of soft gluons that can connect uh, the soft blob to the, to the collinear blobs. That's, that's the result of the, the leading power, um, Libby's, um, Libby's term and power counting. Uh, there is also another detail that is actually uh, one of the most difficult steps in, in, the, in the proof of factorization of Trillian is the fact that you can also have remnant interactions. These are usually called the Glauber modes. And so the, the difficult step in this case for the case of Trillian is to show that actually these uh, remnant interactions cancel uh, when, when you sum over, over all possible diagrams. So now in, in brief, to, 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 to achieve factorization, what you do is to use what is typically called the grammar yeni like uh, approximations. So suppose uh, you are you have a gluon connection between the soft and the uh, collinear function. Then uh, this is essentially just uh, the denominator of the, the gluon propagator. Then at leading power, you can approximate this contraction into something like that. You have K that is contracted with S. And so you can use word identities in this bit to, to essentially to reduce this bit to something with less legs, external legs. And then you have something that has essentially an iconal propagator with uh, with, with this kind of structure. And this is exactly the kind of structures that eventually introduce the, the Wilson lines. So I will, I will tell you a little bit more about Wilson lines later. So if you apply this uh, 
uh, this argument recursively, then you, you finally achieve factorization. So this is written schematically here. So this means that uh, the, the, the amplitude for, for the production of the massive vector boson can be split into something that only uh, obtains to soft modes, collinear, anticollinear modes, and hard modes. And then everything else is power suppressed like one over Q. And so this is just a, a schematic way to, to write factorization. Then, uh, of course, if you want to get the cross section, you need uh, to uh, square and sum over the unobserved um, radiations. And of course, you need also to integrate over the, the loop momentum. And then eventually, factorization leads to uh, an operate to operator definitions. So, first of all, you, you define what, what is typically called jet or beam function, which is essentially just the integral over the minus component in light, uh, in light cone uh, um, coordinates of the, the collinear blob squared. And then you also have the soft function that, that, is, that is also an integral over plus and minus component of the, the squared uh, soft function. Now, let's assume for the moment that, that, the, the, in, that the transverse momentum of the, the gauge boson in Drelian uh, is uh, of the order of uh, the, its invariant mass. And then that this in turn is uh, much larger than lambda QCD. We will consider the case in which QT is much smaller than QA. Um, in this case, one can neglect the partonic momenta KTs, the transverse momenta KTs that uh, circulate uh, in the in the hard uh, in the hard function. So this is actually what uh, enables us to to derive collinear factorization because by doing that, actually we are enabled to uh, short circuit the the integrals over the, the KTs uh, uh, over the jet and the soft functions. So what, what happens when you do that is that first of all, the soft function, uh, the contribution of the soft function cancel. So this doesn't give any direct contribution anymore. And then we are left with uh, the KT integrated jet function that actually gives us uh, uh, the, the definition of the very definition of, of the PDX. And this is what is schematically um, uh, shown here. Uh, this diagram is, of course, is, is in momentum space, but then you can also translate it in, in, in configuration space. And this gives, it gives us the gauge invariant definition of the, the quark PDF in terms of the, the quark fields uh, psi. And you have, you have already seen this definition yesterday. Uh, it's written here again, but uh, this should give you, tell you more or less where this definition comes from. And an important bit of this definition is that we have a Wilson line. This Wilson line is actually really the, the resummation of all scalar gluons that uh, you have that connect the collinear blob to the collinear, to the, um, to the, um, to the Wilson line. And uh, the, the, the Wilson line actually has uh, the, the, the form of a path order exponential of the integral of the, the, gauge, the gauge field. And a similar uh, definition, uh, operator definition also exists for, for the gluon PDF. It's a little more complicated, but looks, looks like pretty much the same. So now uh, let's suppose we are uh, we want to integrate over rapidity and transverse momentum. So we, we really want to compute what Drell and Jan uh, have, uh, have computed back in 1970, and we want to, to see what the part what QCD tells us about Drell Jan. So the, the net result uh, of QCD uh, collinear factorization for Drell Jan is this formula here. So you see that the structure is pretty much the same. So you have the same structure here for PDFs, except that these PDFs here are actually bare PDFs. So this, uh, this is the meaning of these zeros here. I will tell you more about that later. Uh, but then this also introduces uh, a so-called partonic cross-section. So this is actually the cross-section computed by considering uh, partons, quarks in the case of QCD as, as, uh, as uh, colliding particles. Uh, since uh, this bit is actually connected with the hard part of the factorization format, this, this, this is computable in perturbation theory. And so suppose you want to compute it to NP leading order, then the expansion of the, this partonic cross-section looks like this. So you have a leading order contribution that doesn't depend on, on alpha s. And then you have perturbative corrections that are dependent on powers of alpha s. So of course, if alpha s is small enough at the scale Q, then these corrections become smaller and smaller as n increases. So you see immediately that if you truncate the QCD to leading order, one finds back the part of the model. So this is a, this is a kind of uh, uh, proof that uh, QCD does reproduce the part of the model if one makes the most crude approximation, so the, the leading order. 
as I said, the QCD in principle should allow us to improve on the partner model. So we would like to go beyond the leading order to, to make more, to produce more accurate predictions. And if you try to do that, that actually you, you come into, uh, you get into trouble. And the reason is that uh, uh, assuming to work for, for a moment in massless QCD, so we, we are neglecting the, the masses of, of, of quarks and we're working for dimensions, which is also appropriate. Then what happens is that uh, the partonic cross section is actually affected by collinear divergences. So this means that uh, in, in the moment that we integrated over KT uh, of the of the KT of the uh, of uh, the, the radiation, then this guy this guy here diverges. And then on top of that, the operator definition of the PDF as given in the previous slide actually evaluates to zero. And uh, this, uh, this zero is actually the result of a cancellation of ultraviolet and infrared divergences, where by infrared, I mean when KT goes to zero and ultraviolet when KT goes to infinity. Uh, fortunately, something, in my opinion, magical happens. So, and this is just a sketchy, um, uh, I, this is just a sketch of what really happens at one loop. So if you, for instance, consider only one, one, one single radiation. So in this case, we are considering something that is, of course, proportional to alpha s because we have one radiation. Then, as I said, you have an infrared divergence that comes from the heart function. And then you have another infrared divergence that comes from, uh, from the PDF. And then a UV divergence that again comes from, from the, the PDF. So it, happen, it so happens that actually this guy canceled, and this is the reason why the PDF evaluates to zero. But the, the, the nice part is actually the infrared divergence between PDF and heart function also cancel. So the moment you put them together, what you are left with is just the UV divergence of the, of the PDF, this guy here. So being that the UV diverges, this can be removed in a, in a standard way, just by defining appropriate randomization constants. And so what you do, you define the bare uh, PDF uh, as being the convolution of uh, appropriate renormalization constants, uh, Zij, convoluted with uh, the renormalized uh, PDFs. So the renormalization constants are usually well, can be and are usually uh, computed in the, the MS bar renormalization uh, scheme. Uh, of course, they contain the UV divergences of PDFs and are computable uh, order by order in perturbation theory. And this is a structure, this a quite familiar structure of this, uh, of the, the normalization constant. So you have a leading term that actually uh, allows us to reproduce the Barton model, this is important. And then you have all the divergences that happens at at higher loops. And of course, each time you go to higher loops, you have more divergences. And so this is indicated by this epsilon to the k that runs between one and n. Then, as I said, you have the normalized PDS. And of course, in, like in any uh, normalization procedure, you need to introduce a scale that, for instance, using a, a dimensional regularization, one introduces to keep the coupling, uh, the coupling dimensionless. This uh, this what is typically referred to as factorization scale, but it's actually, it's, it's in fact the standard renormalization scale. It's the renormalization scale that you introduce when you renormalize PDFs. Uh, again, a, a standard procedure is once you have this relation for the renormalization of PDFs, you can derive the renormalization group equation. So all you do is just you take the derivative on both sides of this equation. You exploit the fact that, that uh, the right hand side doesn't depend on mu, and this allows us to, to derive uh, this renormalization group equation, where the splitting kernels that are the, uh, the well known Altarelli Parisi kernels are just uh, computed in terms of the, uh, the, the renormalization constant. So this is how the Altarelli Parisi splitting kernels are related to the so to the splitting uh, to the um, renormalization constants. So this is left to, to, to you as an exercise to prove that this is actually the case. So this is the well uh, the, this is the very well known big up uh, evolution equation. This, this is a pos one of the possible ways of deriving that. Importantly, the, uh, the evolution kernels Pij are finite and are perturbative. So this means that uh, they admit perturbative expansion that looks like this. So now let's go back to dragon production after uh, having removed the divergences and after having renormalized the PDFs. And this is how now the dragon cross-section differential in Q-square looks like. 
So again, you have uh, the, the PDFs, but this time the PDFs are renormalized. So, and, and this is indicated by the fact that you don't have the zero and you have the, the dependence on the scale unit. And then on top of that, you have the subtracted partonic cross sections. So the subtracted partonic cross section are just the, the cross section computed in terms of quarks and gluon that have been subtracted uh, from, from the, 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 the collinear divergences that uh, we have discussed before. So once you do that, the, the perturbative expansion of the subtracted partonic cross section looks like this. So again, you have uh, um, a perturbative expansion, so you have powers of alpha s, but then each power of alpha s has this structure here. This is actually also something that I would like you to, to prove, to, to see how this structure in terms of log of powers of log of mu over q, where mu is the factorization scale and q is the, the invariant mass comes out. Uh, so you, you can try that as an exercise. So now having this structure at hand, we know that this, the, the factorization scale mu is in principle arbitrary, can be anything. But actually, since we are working at finite order in perturbation theory, in order for this series truncated series to be convergent, we want that each single uh, coefficient of this, of this series is of order one, because otherwise the, the, the series wouldn't be uh, convergent. A necessary condition, actually necessary, but not necessarily um, sufficient for this to happen is that all these logs are of order one. They cannot be large. Of course, this tells us is this tells us is immediately that the factorization scale has to be of the order of uh, of uh, the, the invariant mass q. So this this is a way of seeing that actually the natural choice for mu is actually q. And then one can prove, and this is actually uh, left for you to to prove it, is that uh, variations of mu around the q of moderate factors, so factors uh, two four at most, uh, give an estimate of higher order corrections. Um, so something that you have also seen yesterday is that uh, uh, PDFs, of course, depend on the tonic uh, um, longitudinal momentum fraction. And this, so this dependence is not uh, perturbatively computable. So actually what people do is to fit, uh, uh, to fit this behavior to data. So they take data and they try to, to see how PDFs behave um, in X. What is computable thanks to the uh, Degrad evolution equation that we have introduced before is the, the mu dependence of PDFs. So what you have to do if you have the, the PDFs at some scale mu zero say, and you wanna know the, the PDFs at the scale, another scale the mu, then all you have to do is just to solve the Degrad evolution equation. This tells you exactly how the PDFs look like at higher scales. So this is typically called evolution. So now, uh, I just wanted to show how this procedure of including the higher order corrections actually impacts our ability of computing things. So here is what happens when you look at uh, the uh, the Crowdrellian cross section um, differential with respect to the invariant mass of uh, the lepton pair. And in this uh, uh, plot, so you see the, the 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 behavior of the cross section normalized to the highest uh, um, perturbative calculation, which is nowadays the next cube leading order, um, as a function of Q. So the upper plot is um, in the, the lower uh, Q uh, region and the, the right hand plot is in the higher uh, Q region. And so you see that going from next leading order in which you include in, in this, uh, in this um, expansion, the first two terms to next to next, to next cube leading log, leading order, sorry. Um, actually, there is a quite nice convergence, meaning that uh, the, the difference between uh, following orders, subsequent orders, tends to become smaller and smaller. And also, remarkably, something that also signals that the series is converging is uh, the fact that uh, the, the estimate of the theory uncertainty, which is pretty much estimated by varying the factorization scale, not only actually, but that's part of that. Um, around the queue becomes smaller and smaller as one includes uh, higher order corrections. And so this means that actually higher order corrections are becoming smaller and smaller. So now, of course, the full inclusive cross section, the sigma, the Q square is theoretically interesting. So we have used to, to we have we are used it to, to, to for, 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 for looking at the factorization theorem. But of course, it would be very interesting to go more differential. 
so we want something that is not only differential in Q-square, but is more differential. So the next step could be to look at uh, um, the distribution in Dralian, and not only in Q-square, but also in the rapidity. The rapidity is defined at this way, where Q and E are the energy and the, 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 the three momentum uh, of the, the z boson. We have already seen this fireball yesterday. And then if you do that, uh, collinear factorization uh, works just as well as in uh, the, the Y uh, inclusive case. And then you end up with a factorized formula that looks like this. Again, you have the normalized PDFs and you have um, a subtracted partonic cross-section that is actually now a little more complicated, but also obeys uh, a perturbative expansion that looks like this. And here, again, you have uh, um, the leading order that actually uh, allows us to recover the parton model. Uh, remarkably, also in this case, the cancellation of the, the infrared divergences between PDFs and um, partonic cross sections takes place. Uh, and so we, one can use this formula, uh, just improving on this, to compute the, the differential cross section of Drelian differentially in, in rapidity. And this is what has been done in this also very famous paper, in which uh, the rapidity distribution in Drelian is computed at leading order, in which you only include the, the, the leading order term here, next to leading order, in which you include the second order, and then next to next, in which you also include the third order. So you see that, again, the convergence is pretty nice. And also, uh, what is remarkable is that uh, the theoretical uncertainty, which, again, is estimated by varying uh, uh, the scales around the, the, the central uh, scale, which is the invariant mass of the uh, of the lepton pair, becomes smaller and smaller as one goes to higher. So this means that again, also looking at more differential quantities, uh, the perturbative series is converging. Now, so far so good. So now, can we try to be even bolder than that and use collinear factorization uh, to compute uh, the differential cross section in Dralian? not only in Q-square Y, but also in the, the uh, transverse momentum of the, the z -bolt. Well, you can do that. You just have uh, all the tools. You just do the calculation. It's very complicated, of course. And actually, a fully uh, a full next-to-next -next leading order calculation for this process has been, uh, uh, has been carried out very recently with uh, the NNO jet calculation. And in this plot, uh, uh, what you see is that uh, you see a comparison between the very recent uh, ATLAS data and uh, the next to next to leading order uh, calculation. So here is without uh, lateral corrections and here is with lateral corrections. But actually what I would like you to concentrate on is in the low QT region. So what you see is that despite these corrections are next to next to leading order accurate. So we, 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 we already know that they should be quite accurate uh, so that higher order corrections cannot be that large. Yet something seems to be going wrong in this region. So at relatively low uh, PT, and PT, and here we are at Q of the order of the Z mass. You see that the deviation between data and predictions starts getting bad. And of course, as you may guess, this, this, this gets worse and worse as you go to lower values of PT. So, of course, no wonder that this something wrong is happening because we derived collinear factorization by requiring that QT is of the order of Q. If this assumption uh, breaks down, so if QT is much smaller than Q, then something, something wrong happens. So one can go and analyze uh, the fixed order cross section for the PT distribution. And for QT different from zero and next to P leading order collinear calculation has the following structure. So first of all, it starts at order alpha s. So this reason, the reason is that uh, there is a contribution of order one, but this actually only appears when qt is equal to zero. So this means that it's proportional to delta qt. So uh, we will see later why this has to be like that. Um, now, there is a question for you to answer. Do, do you think that there are terms proportional to delta qt also beyond uh, order one, for instance, to order alpha s, alpha s squared? If so, where, where do they come from? Any, any guess on that? So now there is another bit uh, that is important is that uh, here we seem to have uh, logarithmically enhanced terms. And actually this give uh, uh, rise to non-integrable singularities at QT. And so th these are powers of uh, log of uh, Q over QT divided over QT squared. You, you already have seen these this, this corrections yesterday. Also something important is that uh, these logs actually appear up to two 
for each power of alpha s. So here there is a log of 2n minus 1, and then actually this can be counted like a log correction. But in a, well, I, I will give you more details on that. And then, of course, you have power corrections because, of course, this expansion is only valid when Qt is much smaller than Q. And then you have corrections that vanish when Qt over Q becomes small, but become important when Qt is of the order of Q. So now you see immediately that if Qt is much smaller than Q, these guys here become large. Um, and so you, you see immediately that uh, any truncation of this series, if these guys are large, is, is inaccurate because it spoils the convergence of the, uh, the perturbative series. So this means that it is no longer true that higher order corrections in alpha s are smaller than, than previous orders. So this means that uh, we, we just cannot truncate uh, the, the series. In, in fact, I mean, what we see is that the, the, the cross-section not only um, is not uh, computable in perturbation theory, but uh, the cross-section diverges uh, and the divergence is not integrable at Qt equals zero. So this is a, an actually a realistic uh, calculation of the differential cross-section in the y, the q, and the qt. And the red curve is the leading order co computation at order alpha s, and the, uh, the blue curve is the next leading order computation, which includes also alpha s co square corrections. And what you see is that if qt is large enough, well, they are not that different. But when qt starts becoming small, not only the two guys diverge, but actually they also diverge in different directions. So things really start getting crazy. In, in, in this region. So really, this means that we cannot trust fixed order calculations at small values of Qt. So as I said, these logs also uh, imply the presence of a non-integrable non divergence. So this means that if you integrate uh, this differential cross-section, hoping to get back the cross-section in Q square and Y, that, that just doesn't work, you get infinity, you cannot get anything finite out of this interval. So something is missing. And so this is again a question to you. Do you can you guess what is actually missing? What would make this integral uh, convergent? The other questions that I would like to, to answer in the, the next slides is what, what is the origin of these uh, large logs in the low QT region? And mo more importantly, actually, can we resolve them all? Can we find a way to extend this series from one to infinity. So we really want to resume all of them. Well, a classical reference to answer these questions is uh, discussed in, in a paper that now is uh, 40 years old, more than 42. And it was discussed by Parisian Petron so in this very nice paper that I would suggest everybody to read. So uh, to, to, to explain uh, the argument, uh, what uh, they, they tried to do was to uh, consider a, a QED process. To, to get rid of all the complications um, given by the QCT as non abelian theory. And so they, they, they consider E plus E minus into mu plus E minus plus any number of additional photons. Um, and then the process happens through a, a photon exchange, so this guy here. Um, and the n photons are only emitted by the initial uh, the, the initial electrons. So, and this actually is, is really engineered to, to, to to resemble uh, the hadronic case in QCT. So then uh, they, they, they make the first stop, step and they say, well, if you want to have a, a QT of, the, of the, um, the vector boson different from zero, of course, you need at least an additional photon against which the, the, the vector boson uh, recoils. And this is uh, this photon indicated here. Uh, so, I mean, this means that the, the lowest order process you need to consider is E plus E minus into mu plus mu minus plus one jet. And so you see immediately that in QCD, uh, the cross section has to start at order alpha s, is something that I've already highlighted before. Then, of course, you understand that in this particular uh, condition, the KT of the additional photon is equal to the QT, the KT, the KT of the, the virtual photon. And so if QT is much smaller than Q, but actually also another requirement is that Q is of the order of the, the invariant mass uh, of the center of mass energy. So and here another question to you, do you, can you guess what happens if Q is much smaller than S? So we, we are setting this aside for, for a moment. So in this case here, uh, the additional photo that is emitted here has to be soft. So this means that all the components of this guy have, are much smaller than Q. 
So uh, Parisian patrons actually did the, the, the calculation and what they got for QT different from zero uh, is uh, this expression here. So that, that the differential cross-section in QT is proportional to uh, sigma zero, which is the total cross-section for E plus C minus into mu plus mu minus plus anything times a log of Q over QT over Q squared. Of course, you have the power of alpha s, which is driven by the fact that you have an additional four, a photon, and then you have less singular terms. You have other stuff, but this is the dominant. Uh, the dominant contribution when Qt is smaller than is, is much smaller than Q. So it, it is easy to extend uh, this computation to also include Qt equals zero. This actually should answer one of the questions that I asked before. So. We know that uh, this, the integral between zero and q square has to be equal to sigma uh, to sigma zero, so to the to the inclusive cross section, to the total cross section. Then this means that uh, if you define the sigma dqt square like uh, sigma uh, sigma zero times a delta plus the term that we have already seen here, but this time plus prescribed. So you have this plus prescription here that is defined as follows here. And then if you integrate over QT, you get back exactly sigma zero. So this is also something that is probably useful for you, for you to, to, to prove. So then what you do, you define what Parisian patrons have done is to define a cumulant cross-section, what they call uh, sigma capital uh, of KT. And this is just uh, the, the integral between zero and some KT, this, uh, this variable, over the, 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 the total cross-section. So you can split this integral between something that is between zero and Q square, and then the rest that between KT and Q. This guy gives one uh, by virtue of this, of this equality here. So sigma zero cancels. And so at the end of the day, you get one, which comes from here, times the integral of this thing here that uh, is actually equal to this because when computed this integral we can neglect about uh, we can forget about delta function and the plus prescription because uh, the, the lower uh, the lower limit of the integral is not zero so you actually what you need to do is to do the the integral of this guy and what you get is a log square of q over kt so uh, of course here we have neglected sub subleading terms something that i would like you to notice is that uh, this Cumulant cross section is really engineered in such a way that if you take the, the, the derivative with respect to KT, you get back the cross section normalized by the total cross section. So now, of course, the next step is natural. What happens if you include n photons in the in the final state? Uh, well, th th there is a well known result. Actually, you can you can check it in the Peshkin Schroeder um, that tells us that the soft photons factorize. In QET. So this is the so-called uh, iconal approximation. So if you have uh, an electron that emits um, n photons and all these photons are uh, soft, then uh, the amplitude for this uh, uh, guy can be written in terms of the product of amplitudes of single soft photon emissions weighted by, by this factor one over n factorial, which I would invite you to, to understand why it has to be there. And the, the single emission of a soft photon is parameterized by something that is, of course, proportional to the, to the coupling alpha and the function of KT. Actually, this result is also true in QCD. This has been proved, uh, proven uh, quite some time ago now. And so this, this is a reference in which you can see that this works also in QCD. It is more complicated because QCD is not easy. So if you if you play this game and then what you do you take the Kuhn cross section and then you include more, any any possible number of, of additional soft photons. So one gives us no photon emission. This guy here proportional to alpha to alpha gives one photon emission. This is exactly what we have derived in the previous slide. But then you you can include more photons, two photons and more photons. Of course you see that actually. By doing that, you can include any number of photons all the way up to infinity. And you see that the structure of this guy gives us, gives us an exponential. So it really resumes. So this is, a, this is an example of exponentiation, which actually um, uh, implements a resumation of, 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 uh, of terms to all orders in, in, in the, the perturbative coupling. So now, to get uh, the normalized cross section, as I said, you just take the derivative of this guy, the pseudo, what is typically called the pseudo four factor, and you get this uh, this formula for uh, the 
the transverse momentum distribution of Trojan. This is the so-called uh, double leading globe approximation. It's double because you have two logs here. Uh, and remarkably, the, the, this, uh, this result is no longer divergent for QT going to zero. So this means that uh, by resumming all the, uh, all the, the powers in alpha s in the case of QCT, actually also uh, made the, the, the cross-section convergent at QT uh, equals zero, which wasn't the case in the fixed order case. In fact, this guy, if you take the limit for QT, uh, KT in this case, going to zero, it's, it goes to zero. And so this is a, a sketch of what the DLLA looks like. Uh, so the cross-section looks like as a function of KT. So you have the K at uh, large KT, but then the, the cross-section also goes exponentially to zero when KT becomes uh, small. Unfortunately, this is a problem uh, because uh, this exponential uh, suppression of the DLLA is not what is experimentally observed. Actually, experimentally, people observe that uh, the cross section differential dkt squared, so it's important to have square here, goes to a constant. And so in this plot, you see an example of exactly this cross section taken by, by the, one of the uh, Fermilab experiments, E605. Uh, and so the, the data, which, has, which are the, the black dots, you see that the, the, the distribution goes to a constant as QT uh, goes to zero. So this is the actual observable, but actually you can prove that this proportion to dy, uh, the sigma dy, the QT squared. So you see it really goes to, to a constant. So what's wrong with the LLA? Well, there is a, there is a, a, a major problem is the fact that uh, the emitted photons soft photons that we have considered and that we have resumed are all independent. So they just don't talk to each other. Of course, in this configuration, the only possibility to get uh, a QT equals zero, so, so that the QT of the vector boson is zero is that all photon, that there are no photons emitted. And so we need to beat on that. Of course, the probability of emitting no photons is at zero. And so is the cross section. So this explains why the DLLA cross section is, is zero at QT equals zero. But in reality, if you have more than a single photon emitted by, 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 by the initial state in this case, it is possible to get QT equals zero by just taking the vectorial sum of all the transverse momenta of the soft gluons emitted in, in, the, in the final state. So this is an example. So here you have four momenta, so from K1 to K4. They, they all seem, they are all different from zero. But then if you take the vectorial sum, they, they close. So this means that the vectorial sum of these guys gives zero. So actually, this configuration is actually allowed, uh, but it's not taken into account by the LLA. So this means that the LLA overly constrains uh, the, uh, the phase space around QT equals zero. So there is something missing. So this means that the leading, uh, the leading contribution at QT equals zero actually goes to zero, such that the sub-leading contributions become important and have to be taken into account. So in fact, the, the main shortcoming of the LLA is the fact that it doesn't implement momentum conservation. So I mean, we, we didn't care about uh, emitting some momentum and, and we didn't take, uh, take into account the fact that this would affect also the uh, the momentum of the, the final state uh, um, vector boson. So, well, the, the solution is simple. Just uh, let us enforce the momentum conservation. So you just take uh, the, the cumulant cross-section, the way we define that. You remember it was uh, um, a sum of uh, terms like this. And then just let's plug in uh, the momentum conservation that, data function. Well, uh, now, now what, what's the next step? The, the, the problem is that this data function uh, um, entangles all, all momenta. And so this means that the exponentiation is, is spoiled. So we cannot really carry out all these integrals one by one and eventually resume all the terms. Well, the way, the way out is just uh, to use the Fourier representation of the delta function, which is written here. And you saw that you see that you, you all know that uh, the Fourier in, in Fourier space it is just written in terms of exponential that of course factorize. And so what we can do, we can plug this uh, representation uh, in the in the in the Sudak of four factor, and then what we do is just uh, we essentially just do the calculation, and what happens is that exponentiation does take place, but it doesn't take 
place in QT space, but it takes place in, in this space, which is often called the impact parameter space. So you have a Fourier transform of an exponential of the Fourier transform of the probability of the emission probability. And this is what the uh, uh, new uh, tilde is. So this means that in impact parameter space, exponentiation and resumation does take place. And actually this uh, trick also uh, ensures, cures the problem of the LLA for, for QT going to zero and you get something that is actually constant when, when, uh, when QT goes to zero. So actually the full-fledged extension of this formalism was, um, was worked out uh, uh, now quite some time ago by Colin Sopper and Ernst German in this very famous paper. And so the final uh, formula that uh, they obtained is of course very complicated, but it has all the elements that we have just defined in, uh, in, uh, in the case uh, the, uh, studied by Parisian potential. So first of all, uh, there is a Fourier transform. This means that this, uh, this formula um, uh, use the, 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 the impact parameter space. So this is the Fourier transform. Uh, this is also a question for uh, for you. So this is a Bessel function. Can you uh, can you see why the Fourier transform, which is a bidimensional Fourier transform, uh, as you see here, reduces to to this kind of structure here? So this uh, as an exercise. Then actually in the the original formula there are two bits. The 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 first one is in uh, the red box and this is what is typically called the, the white term and this is actually dominant when qt is much smaller than q so this this term actually implements the resumation but uh, in order to make uh, the the cross section this calculation valid also when q is of the order uh, qt is of the order of q they also included the term that is called the white term that contains the powers uh, the power corrections that eventually become uh, important when when qt becomes of the order of q um, then let's focus on uh, the resumation bit. Well, you have a function H, which is called the hard function, and this is actually the, the connected with the, the virtual emissions. And this uh, this comes from the calculation of the hard function, if you remember factorization. Then you have uh, that. Uh, also, you have PDFs, collinear PDFs involved in the calculation, but these PDFs. Um, are matched. This uh, is uh, the, the jargon, and uh, so the PDFs are actually convoluted with uh, perturbative uh, coefficients c. Uh, this actually takes into account uh, the effect of uh, unresolved real emissions. So it's, you, you, you don't you don't see these emissions. And then there is uh, the actual uh, pseudo comfort factor, which, as you see, is an exponential. It's it looks much more complicated than we saw before, but it is actually. A double log uh, um, exponential because actually this integral here and this log here gives uh, a log square, and this is actually what actually implements the resumption of large logs. Um, and this, of course, it takes into account the emission of soft gluons and resum them. So now, what I would like to do is to make uh, to bridge uh, QT resumption a la CSS. So what we have just seen, uh, starting from say. Uh, the, the idea, the reasoning of Parisian Pedroncio to TMD factorization. So TMD factorization is something that can be opposed to collinear factorization. It's something that in some respect is perhaps more general, but uh, I, I would like to try to show you that actually TMD factorization essentially does the very same thing as QT resumation. Um, so we have seen a very uh, sketchy uh, proof of uh, factorization. And so now let's go back to that proof and let's uh, take uh, the factorization before integrating over QT and before assuming that QT was of the order of Q. So the cross section has this factorized formula here, perhaps you remember. So hard function, collinear functions and soft function. And here there are dots and these dots are actually um, indicate integrations over internal transverse momentum. Then something that is remarkable is that uh, the soft function is, of course, not observable in Drelian. So you, you cannot really disentangle the, all the, the blobs. So what you can do, you can define uh, the TMD PDFs uh, just by absorbing the square root of S into A and the remaining square root of S into B. So you define the TMD PDFs like A uh, square root of S and B square root of S. Um, now, remarkably, H, FA, and FB are all finite. 
but it is actually not true for for the single pieces like i'm like i'm not gonna say much about that but anyway the final form of tmd factorization is like this so you have a hard function and the convolution with the tmd pdfs and this is the essence of uh, uh, tmd factorization so it's perhaps unsurprising that uh, um, if you go into the parameter space uh, then uh, these convolutions uh, that I've been talking about become become uh, products, and then what you end up, you end up uh, with uh, with in, in TMD factorization is a format that looks like this. So you have a hard function, and then you have uh, a Fourier uh, transform using the the, the, the Bessel function as done in the CSS formalism of two TMD PDFs. So now these two TMD PDFs uh, are finite. But actually, the finiteness of these uh, uh, two TMD uh, PDFs actually arise from the cancellation of what are called the rapidity divergences that actually happen singularly in S and A. The moment you, you do these combinations, these, uh, these uh, divergences cancel. And, but what you are left with is a scale, which is the zeta scale. And so this zeta scale is there because it originates from the the cancellation of the rapidity divergences between the soft and the collinear themes. Uh, they're actually constrained kinematically. So in this particular formula, the product of the two has to be equal to Q, Q to the fourth. So they are not um, as free as uh, uh, renormalization scale. In fact, there is also a renormalization scale mu. And this is actually just a consequence of the ultraviolet renormalization of the, of the parameters of the Lagrange. So in particular, of the of the wave function and so there is also this um, renormalization scale uh, dependence whose constraint is just to be of the order of q so it's not as constrained as the rapidity scales so now the dependence of uh, um, of tmd pdfs on the renormalization and of, um, Rapidity scales is computable in perturbation theory. This is very similar to what you would do for collinear PDFs using the Diga equation. But TMD PDFs have their own um, um, uh, equa evolution equations. So they are summarized in this slide. I'm not, I, since I'm running out of time, I don't want to go through all the details, but uh, these are the evolution equations that TMD PDFs obey. Then you also need to take into account the fact that TMD PDFs can be matched onto, um, onto um, collinear PDFs. Actually, there is a typo here. This should be C. Um, and then by using the solution of these equations and the fact that the TMD PDFs can be matched onto collinear PDFs for, for values of B small enough, then you end up with the, the, a solution for the um, TMD PDFs in terms of collinear PDFs. Uh, matching functions and uh, an evolution factor. So it's actually up to you to try to derive this, this formula. Anyway, one can, can put everything together. One can relate to the anomalous dimensions that appear in these evolution equations with the function A and B that appear in the CSS formalism to come up with this formula here. Then if you take this TMD PDFs, you put them back into the TMD factorization formula, what you recover is the CSS formula. Of course, this is no surprise. Uh, after all, CSS and TMD factorization are the same thing. They have to be consistent. They have to give the same result. But actually, the reason why I uh, first derived the, the CSS, well, I introduced the CSS um, using uh, an approach that was inspired by um, Parisian Petroncio. And the reason why then I eventually introduced uh, TMD factorization with uh, the evolution equations is to I like the fact that there are two different ways of achieving resummation of large logs. The first one is a diagrammatic approach, which is the one that Parisian Petroncio have, have taken, uh, taken long ago. Uh, so what you do, you really factorize uh, single emission at the, at the level of single diagrams, then you prove that these emissions in some in some limit exponentiate, so you can you can really resum them all to all orders, um, and then you you, the, you 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 can you can use this this approach to to prove that, uh, that any number of um, emissions factorize. Um, this approach uh, is actually uh, used. Uh, 
directly as is in, in momentum space without the need to go into the impact parameter space, even though in, in momentum space, the factorization and exponentiation, exponentiation is not, uh, is not uh, apparent. Um, this, uh, this formalism is used by some Monte Carlo event generators. They are not general proposal Monte Carlo generators like those that, that for instance, Stefan has discussed yet, but that, yes, but they are uh, specific Monte Carlo generators that treat this kind of, uh, that implement this kind of resolution. And the advantage of working in momentum space is that uh, you have access to the, to the physics. You really can look at uh, exclusive uh, cross sections. You can really, for instance, look at single gluons. And so this is somehow something more uh, physically appealing because you can gain more insight into the physics of, of resolution. On the other hand, there is the TMD factorization approach, which is based on the renormalization group equations. So essentially what you do, you identify the singular behaviors of the single pieces, and then you write down evolution equations whose solution implements the resonation. That's, that's, the, that's the basic of the RG approach to, to, to uh, resonation in general. The advantage of this approach is that uh, this uh, typically allows us to um, Obtain, uh, um, obtain formulas that are analytical. So we can get something that is easier to implement. So this is also appealing in that respect. So now let me go to the final uh, uh, part of the, the talk. So this, can, this is gonna take me five minutes. I, I was is wondering Valerio whether we might want to postpone this to tomorrow's lecture because today is an extremely full day in the school right. schedule. And tomorrow we might have a bit more leeway to, to, to have a few minutes more or less. Um, All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fine. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yes. That's that's gonna take me five minutes tomorrow. I hope not to be late tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I think tomorrow it. being five minutes late is not not too much. Of All right. Hours. All right. Very good. Okay. So that's that then, uh, that's Thanks it so for today. If there are questions or anything. Yes. Let's let's see whether there are some quick questions to take now, or otherwise we can also go for the recitation sessions and have more discussion there. I don't see any in the chat and I also don't see any hands raised yet. Is anyone interested in asking questions? Yes, so something I would like to stress again that uh, as you have seen, there are these questions uh, scattered all over the place in which that I would like everybody to, to take a look at and try to answer. And this, these are things that we can, we can eventually discuss tonight. Um, some are simpler, some are harder. And then on top of that, I've also collected uh, a number of, uh, you know, questions that we can discuss tonight again. And uh, yeah, I would also encourage you to, to take a look at that. This is super useful. Thank you very much for preparing those. And also thank you very much for your lecture up to now. We will see the second part tomorrow. And I still don't see any questions, so I think we can close close our lecture session for now and we will see each other again this afternoon with two more um, specialized lectures and we will see Valerio again tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>